All right, well, it's 4.01 now, so we can go ahead and get started. Hello, my name is Logan Johnson. I'm the Northeast Region Coordinator for the Forest Stewards Guild. I'd like to welcome you to the first session of our Oak mini series for forest landowners, um, where today we'll focus on wildlife. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the chat window, um, which you can access at the bottom of your screen and will likely pop up in the right hand column. Um, and you can submit your questions in the chat window throughout the presentation, which we will answer, save and answer at the end of the session with our Q&A portion of the event. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's session on wildlife, Brian Hawthorne, who is the program habit Habitat Program Manager for the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Brian, you can take it away. Great. Thank you, Logan. Let me just get my screen reorganized here so that I can. All right, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, as, as Logan said, I'm the uh, Habitat Program Manager at Mass Wildlife. Uh, in that role, I'm responsible for overseeing all of our habitat management and habitat conservation on, uh, on mass wildlife owned wildlife management areas. What I'd like to talk to you today about today is your oak forest and wildlife. One second. All right, so the first question is, what, is your, what does wildlife want from your oak forest? And in a word, the answer is habitat. Most forest landowners see wildlife as among the most important parts of their forest, but what does wildlife see as the most important parts of an oak forest? The specifics, of course, depend on what wildlife species or groups of species that we're talking about. But in general, all wildlife habitat is, designed by, is defined by access to food, water, space, and cover. High quality habitat has consistent sources of food and water throughout the year, every year, enough space to avoid disturbance or competition, and cover to provide protection while foraging, nesting, raising their young, or escaping from predators. What's special about an oak forest? How is it different from other forests? Perhaps the biggest difference is the need for occasional disturbance to the forest canopy and forest floor. While an individual tree may live for centuries, without occasional openings in the canopy and scuffing of the soil, young oak trees cannot establish and the forest will gradually become some other sort of forest. Most people in this country move every seven years on average, so they have a static view of forests. Over a human lifetime, the trees in an oak forest will grow and some will die, but if nothing, gets, if nothing happens to get enough light to the forest floor, no new oak trees will establish. A few of the other important things about oak forests are that uh, the production of acorns, uh, which are an enormous wildlife food, uh, they, they're produced annually with periodic mast years, uh, which simply means a year in which if a lot of acorns are produced. Uh, oaks are also fire tolerant, so they can withstand some, some disturbance. Oops, sorry about that. And uh, again, we require those gaps in order to grow young trees. So your forest is not just trees, it's, it's also what's growing on the forest floor. And wildlife relies on that both for food and for cover. So deer, for example, are looking for acorns, twigs, grasses, sedges. Birds are looking for insects and berries and seeds and acorns, of course. Pollinators are looking for flowers on the ground and in the trees and shrubs. But to get those understory values, you need enough light to reach the forest floor. Just a quick word about uh, birds and acorns. Uh, many people think of squirrels as uh, being uh, the primary planters of acorns. And at least in Southern New England, the, the blue jay is the, the champion at uh, poking acorns into the soil and then leaving them there to grow into trees. So the good news about deer, if that's uh, what you would like to see, is that if you have a healthy oak forest, you probably won't have to do anything to attract them to your property. They'll seek out acorns in the fall, young oak saplings and twigs for winter and spring browse, and will eat just about everything that grows in the summer. That's also the bad news. With large predators such as the wolf and mountain lion extirpated in Southern New England, the primary things keeping their population in check are hunters and motor vehicles. In areas without managed hunting, 
care populations can strip a forest of everything growing as high as they can reach. And we'll talk a little bit later about the browse line. But if you, but just briefly, if you go out in your forest and you bend down to about the height of a deer and you look through your understory uh, and you see nothing growing, you probably have too many deer. So everyone always talks about birds in forests and I'm going to avoid going into details on a lot of specific uh, bird species, but um, in general, populations of many forest bird species have been declining for decades. For example, this is a chestnut-sided warbler here. Uh, they've been declining because of, primarily because of lack of young forest and lack of canopy gaps in older forests. So again, as with, uh, as with the uh, regenerating uh, oak trees, forest disturbance is the key. Getting light uh, to the ground is the most important thing. And I'll apologize here, uh, just take a moment to apologize to the foresters in the crowd. Um, I tried to simplify my presentation as much as possible to avoid getting into long discussions about silviculture and uh, the, the, the complex interactions in forests, uh, but hopefully this will still be of some value to you. So the other, many people are interested in uh, pollinators. And although oaks in particular are wind pollinated, many species of trees and some shrubs such as maples and the service berry that's uh, pictured here, also known as shadbush, um, are pollinated by bees and other insects. And in addition, many early flowering spring wildflowers are also insect pollinated. So providing, uh, ensuring that there are adequate pollinators in the forest will support not only those shrub and tree species, but also the uh, understory uh, early spring flowering wildflowers. In addition, uh, many species of oaks, in particular white oak, will provide uh, dramatic winter shelter for bees and other pollinators, especially bees. And in addition to pollinators supporting diversity, Having a diverse forest also supports pollinators. So ensuring that your oak forest supports a, a wide range of tree, shrub, and herb species will attract the largest range of pollinators. So bees and butterflies prefer open canopy, open forest canopies. Again, you're gonna hear me say this quite a few times with enough light reaching uh, the, the forest floor or at least the, the understory shrubs. A great, um, resource is xerxes.org um, and you can go there to find lots of inf additional information about managing your forest for pollinators. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or challenges. Climate change, non-native pests, and pollution are just a few of the challenges facing our oak forests. In the next few slides, I'm going to go over some of the things that make an oak forest more able to bounce back and provide the food and cover that wildlife is looking for. Don't worry if you don't remember the specifics. You can go to the Forest Stewards Guild website and download a two-page PDF that uh, includes all of these questions. So diversity in tree ages increases the ability of the forest to rebound from, from challenges and uh, from disturbance. It also provides um, a wider range of habitat features uh, to different wildlife species. Younger classes of uh, trees, for example, provide leaf and bud browse, while older classes can offer tree cavities and high exposed perches. When you're looking at the age structure of your forest, you wanna look for age class diversity distributed throughout the forest or in patches. Sometimes uh, you may have an even aged forest with a few uh, areas that had previously been gaps from blown down trees or from, from other disturbance where you have some younger trees growing in there. So the question to ask yourself when you're looking at the age structure of your forest as it applies to wildlife uh, use is, 
Is the oak forest principally even aged or are there multiple age classes of oak? Now, this is the first time I'm gonna uh, mention again, uh, the uh, foresters on the, on the call. If you're a landowner and you want to uh, make these decisions about your forest, you need to get a forester. You can, you know, if you can learn enough about this yourself, but the reality is there are trained professionals out there who have studied this for years and who have been working in your neighbor's forests uh, and in forests owned by the city or in the state uh, who, who, have, who have the ability to help you answer these questions. Uh, so when you get to the question like, you know, is your forest principally even aged? Unless you have learned uh, how to go out and age trees, odds are it's going to be very difficult for you as a, as a, as a landowner to, uh, to tell that. Your forester, however, can help you find that information. So you also want to look at tree species diversity. Having more oak species present in your forest increases resilience by improving the odds that in any given year, uh, you'll have one of those mast years. So uh, mast years occur at different uh, periods with different uh, oak species. Some of them will be approximately every three to four years, some a little bit longer. Uh, and in any case, it's, it's, I won't say it's random, uh, but it's it's hard to determine when a mast year is going to happen or not. But the more oak species you have available in your forest, the more likely you'll be having a mast year in any given year, or at least enough acorns to provide the food uh, that the wildlife are looking for. Species diversity beyond oaks can also help increase redundancy in providing uh, food sources. So for example, if you have uh, cherry trees in there or hickory trees, even birch trees, hemlocks, pines, those can help to supplement uh, food sources and, and cover for the wildlife. So again, here's the questions that you should be looking at asking if you're uh, in, in terms of tree species diversity on your forest. But remember I said that it's not just the trees that matter. So you also wanna be looking at shrub layers. Shrub layers can increase resilience by providing alternative sources of browse and mast. So quick, uh, quick overview of some of these wildlife terms uh, for those who are unfamiliar with them. I mentioned mast already, which is usually used to refer to uh, the fruiting parts of, of plants. So uh, nuts, berries, and acorns, that sort of thing. And browse is the, in general, is Non, any non-vegetative parts of the plant. So twigs, saplings, seedlings, that sort of thing. Those shrubs can also provide additional cover and nesting opportunities for wildlife. So the question to ask yourself here is, is there one or more well-developed layer of native shrubs in your understory? And we'll get back to that native question again in a minute. So it's hard to see in this, in this photograph that, that uh, Connor took, but my guess is if you look at those trees in the for, those uh, lower those shorter trees in the foreground, you'll see that there's not very much growing on them about from about five feet down. And I bet if you were to lower this camera down to within a few feet of the ground, you would see a clear browse line in this forest. This forest looks to me like it's had a fairly high deer deer pressure in there, and that can impact uh, the growth of your shrub layers. In addition to shrubs, you also wanna have some herbaceous areas. These increase resilience by providing an early spring food source for wildlife and can serve as potential sites for tree regeneration. So you wanna ask yourself, are there areas where enough light reaches the forest floor for grasses, sedges, or forbs to grow? So one of the great things about answering these questions about resiliency is it gives you the opportunity to just go walk around your woods. Uh, you may think that you've looked at everything, but Every time you have a new question to, to answer about your forest, uh, it gives you a, something new to look for. And so go take a walk around and see if you have any patches where enough light is getting to the ground where you've got grasses growing. It's relatively uncommon unless you've had some sort of disturbance to the overstory, whether it's insect defoliation from gypsy moth or some sort of timber harvest or, or wind disturbance. You also wanna look at, remember I mentioned that browse layer, you wanna mention 
look, look at whether you have over browsing. Too many deer can decrease your native plant diversity. They can prevent tree regeneration by, by uh, primarily eating those oak, oak seedlings and saplings. They can favor invasive plants and they can interact with invasive plants and earthworms to reduce climate resiliency and resiliency in overall dramatically. This combination can result in a forest with little to no soil litter layer, diminished organic soil, and exotic invasive plants, which can limit seedlings of native tree shrubs and herbaceous plant species. So you can, when you're out in your, in your woods, you wanna ask how high is the density of browsers like white-tailed deer or moose? Are you seeing Deer scat everywhere you go? Are you seeing deer tracks in the mud? Is there a clear browse line? And you, you can tell whether it's deer or moose primarily by how high off the ground is the vegetation browsed. So now we get into some more questions that, that are a little bit more detailed that are usually included if you have a forest stewardship or forest management plan. So be sure to ask your forester about them. So in particular, diversity of slope, water, and soil, what we refer to as topographical, hydrological, and edaphic diversity, leads to greater resilience. And I'll admit that in this case here, I cheated. This, this photograph here is not from, uh, from southern New England. It's actually from northern, northern New England, just off the coast of Maine. So the questions to ask yourself when looking at resilience for, uh, for wildlife in oak forests. Is the forest all on a single soil type or on many? If you want, you can uh, go look it up on your, on your own. There's a USDA National Resources Conservation Service has an um, online mapping tool that lets you look at the soils uh, for any location in the, in, the, uh, in the United States. You want to ask, is the underlying bedrock uniform or diverse? Again, there are there are maps from, uh, from USGS that, that show you bedrock types. And, or you can ask your forester to look this, that information up for you. Is there a diversity of landforms? In other words, is your forest all the same slope or do you have hills and slopes in different directions? Aspect is the direction that the, that the slope faces. So if you have east facing slopes, they'll get more morning sun if you have, North facing slopes, they'll be more shaded and cooler. So having a diversity of landforms uh, leads to greater resilience and greater use by wildlife. And finally, is there a single hydrological regime? In other words, is, is your forest entirely dry or are there also wetlands? Do you have streams through your, through your, through your forest or is it just uplands? Disturbance history uh, in Southern New England is probably one of the most uh, important uh, determinants of what your forest is going to be like. Past land use can affect your current forest hydrology and soil conditions. And those in turn can affect the species composition of your forest, growing conditions, and other resiliency factors. So you wanna ask, are the forest soils, soils still recovering from past agricultural land uses, such as cropping or pasturing? And how did those uses affect soil composition and diversity? Was the hydrology impacted? So if you have a forest which used to be a, uh, a pasture for cows, you may find that at some point uh, the farmer put in some drainage ditches to uh, reduce the, the amount of mud in the field. And uh, so you may have a, an artificial stream crossing uh, that crosses your forest uh, with the rest of the forest drier than it was before. Um, on the other hand, you may find that, that because a, an old stone wall has, has filled in a, a, a stream channel, your sections in your forest may be wetter than they were uh, prior to that, that land use change. And you also look at your stone walls. You will frequently find that the land use history on the two sides of the stone, stone wall are significantly different. So one side may have been maintained as a woodlot with, uh, the, with a farmer going in and occasionally you know, cutting trees for firewood. And the other side may have been pastured or even, even plowed. And the stone wall can be a clear indicator of, of those differences. 
Invasive species are unfortunately one of the one of the big challenges that we that we currently have uh, in southern New England. After generations of of farmers um, and homeowners bringing in plants that were uh, that that provided either um, food or um, some visual uh, aesthetic value for humans. Uh, these many of these plants have gotten into the forest and are taking over. Invasive plants can reduce resiliency by outcompeting our native plants, and they usually provide lower quality or less palatable food sources for native wildlife. I'll take a minute here and apologize for the for my predecessors. Uh, many of the in, of the of the worst areas of invasive plants were in fact uh, planted either by uh, my predecessors or those in other states or were funded by by our agencies because at the time when we had uh, primarily regenerating fields there was the the feeling that we needed to provide food resources for for wildlife and at the time nobody had a, had any concept of the idea of an exotic invasive species and so they chose species like Japanese barberry um, autumn olive uh, many of the of the of the uh, berry producing or soft mast producing species that are um, that are a great concern to us today. Invasive insects are another issue. Most of those were were introduced uh, by accident. The exception, of course, being the gypsy moth, uh, which was introduced uh, intentionally as a replacement for silkworms, uh, and then escaped. Uh, and we all know the rest of that history. They can it reduce resiliency by impacting our native plant species, which can also lead to increases in invasive plants. I also wanna talk about the lowly earthworm. So in the Northeast, in Southern New England in particular, all terrestrial earthworms are invasive. They are exotic. They uh, were not here um, prior to uh, European colonization. You, you, you probably all know that we uh, live in a glacial landscape and 14,000 years ago, or give or take a few thousand years, depending on where in Southern New England you are, uh, the, we were underneath a mile of ice and the glacier essentially scraped everything clean. And as it receded uh, and as everything developed, we did not have uh, any earthworms that, that, um, that recolonized the area at least terrestrial earthworms. We do have a few aquatic ones that, that came in, but we'll, uh, we'll get, we don't need to talk about this. Uh, so earthworms reduce fl forest floor nutrient accumulation. Everyone thinks that, you know, earth, earthworms are great in your garden because they, they help to break down uh, organic matter. And any organic gardener will also tell you that you need to constantly be adding organic matter uh, to your garden. So they do the same thing in the forest. They break down the leaves and, and other uh, detritus that are falling from the, the shrubs and trees above. And rather than allowing that the nutrients, those nutrients to accumulate and the forest floor to build up a nice deep layer of organic soil, they will actually uh, increase uh, the breakdown of that. Much of the nutrients are either wa then washed away or go into the atmosphere. In the process, they also decrease species diversity of native herbaceous plants and they can increase the likelihood of invasive plants colonizing an area. So some of the questions to ask yourself with regard to invasive species, is your forest free of invasive plants? Is it free of invasive insects? Are the forest soils populated by invasive, earth, invasive earthworms? In Southern New England, chances are it probably is, but there are a few areas still where uh, forests are located beyond the invasion front. Uh, but with so many people uh, going fishing and dumping earthworms uh, after they're done fishing on the sides of streams, many of those areas will probably also be invaded by earthworms soon. So you also want to ask yourself, is there evidence of impact from those non-native earthworms? Do you, are you seeing bare soil with no, no litter layer? That's usually because the earthworms have been eating all, all the forest litter. Are there tree roots and the bases of trees exposed? Normally, uh, as, as the organic layer builds up in a forest, it will cover those tree roots and cover the, the, the um, bases of the trees. If you're seeing uh, exposed roots, 
it's either that you have wet soils and those those uh, those tree roots are trying to get above the water layer, or it's because you have earthworms that are that are eating all the organic matter. And I want to finish up by talking by telling you that you can hear the difference between oak forests that have no gaps within them and no light reaching the ground. If you go sit in them, they're often silent. If you spend much time in the woods, you probably know that the only way to hear or see wildlife is to sit still and quiet and wait for the wildlife to consider you as part of the background. If you do that in a closed canopy, undisturbed forest, you'll sit a very long time and you may hear just a few forest breeding birds calling. If you sit in a forest which has had a recent wind disturbance or timber harvest or other gap creating event, within minutes, you'll be surrounded by dozens of birds of many species, all calling to you and singing to each other. The diverse understory and complex forest structure provides food and cover for these birds. If you wanna hear more information about what your options are for, uh, for making gaps in your forest, I encourage you to attend the forestry session, uh, which I believe is this Thursday at 4 p.m. to learn more about the topic. Uh, and I think I'm just about at half an hour, so I'd be glad to answer any questions that people have. Great, thank you so much for that presentation, Brian. Uh, I really appreciate how you had questions outlined in there for landowners to think about as they explore their woodlands. Um, at, at this time, we're going to move into the question and answer portion of this session. Um, and I'd also invite Andrea Urbano, uh, Fern Graves, and Christopher Riley to turn on their cameras and unmute themselves as they'll be our panelists for today. Andrea will be our final um, presenter in our climate change session next Tuesday, and Fern will be our forestry presenter for um, our forestry session on Tuesday. Um, to get started with the questions, um, Brian, what kinds of shrubs are good for wildlife and what, what should landowners be looking out for? So, um, native shrubs is, is the short answer. <laughs> um, they're really, uh, almost any of our native shrubs that, that you have in oak forest will be, will be helpful. Uh, in particular shrubs that are, that produce berries um, can, can, in addition to providing the, you know, the cover, they can also provide a, a source of soft mast. So the higher shrubs would be things like um, uh, nanny berry, uh, wild raisin, that sort of thing. Uh, so those are viburnum species. Uh, the lower shrubs would be things like low bush blueberry. Uh, you may have seen a photograph of one of those in my, in my uh, presentation. Lowbush blueberry, uh, other things in, in the oak forests would be uh, black huckleberry, Galosachia baccata, uh, and um, let me think, what else is there? Uh, you definitely, it's, it's, it's all right to have some amount of mountain laurel. Uh, it's very common in oak forests in Southern New England. Uh, your forester may tear his hair out because it makes it very difficult to walk through uh, an oak forest that has a dense mountain laurel understory and dense understories of mountain laurel can also reduce the uh, possibility of uh, regenerating the forest uh, but it, it can be done as long as you put gap put your gaps in areas that uh, that aren't dense with mountain laurel mountain laurel does have is great for for providing cover and and uh, com and structural complexity for wildlife uh, but you don't really have to plant it it's going to probably going to be there on its own Great, thank you. Um, and participants out there, please feel free to uh, submit your questions in the chat window. I have a few to pull from right now, but uh, the more questions, the better. Um, any of our other panelists have other thoughts to add to Brian's um, thoughts on what kind of shrubs are good for wildlife or should we move on to the next one? I could, I could add though, Brian said this, I just wanna reiterate native shrubs. Um, scientists have found that berries produced from invasive species like that of barberry are relatively nutrient poor, meaning they lack adequate nutrients for our native species, particularly birds. Um, so I think for landowners out there, the most important thing is to control 
invasive. Um, it's interested in healthy uh, sugar um, production in your forest. And, and we have lists we can distribute, if interested, of native alternatives, depending on what invasive species you may have. And I'll just also put a quick shout out here for uh, pollinator species. So there are many flowering shrubs that may not produce berries or, or, or many or really large fruits. They may be produce small dry fruits, that sort of thing. Um, but they can be extremely valuable if the wildlife that you're looking for are pollinators, whether it's bees or butterflies. And so thing, examples of that might be something like a spice bush which would actually support that spice bush swallowtail that I had a photograph of sitting on a uh, on a gray birch leaf. Um, there was actually a spice bush nearby. Um, there was also um, sassafras is another great one in some areas. Uh, that's another native shrub which is common in some of our drier oak sites uh, and uh, the spice bush swallowtail and many other butterflies will also use that. In that case it's not so much the flowers that they're looking for. In that case, it's the, uh, the leaves that the, that the larvae of the butterflies eat. Great, thank you both. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Um, one participant says they didn't know that um, earthworms were not native to this region. Um, are there any other common misconceptions we should know about as far as native and invasive species go? That's a good one. Yeah, earthworms is one. I always try to mention the earthworms because so many people are just not aware that, that we don't have any terrestrial uh, earthworms. I think some of the other things are that we have many species of, of trees that are, uh, that are related to our native species, but that are um, non-native. And some of those can be invasive. So it's not so much a problem in oak forests, but for example, Norway maples are very commonly uh, planted as shade trees in yards and on, and on the streets, and they will uh, regenerate in our forests. And uh, they do not have the same uh, food value for wildlife. Uh, they, um, and they can take over in areas. They will also like uh, red maple, they are a generalist that can grow in many places. So you could get, if you have, uh, you know, Norway maple somewhere nearby, it could end up in your, in, uh, in your forest. So when we're talking about, you know, the difference between uh, native species and exotic species, you know, what, probably one of the biggest misconceptions is that, you know, it's an either or. You have to remember that every species is native somewhere. And uh, we just want to avoid uh, introducing species that are going to outcompete our, our native species because while they may in the short term outcompete those species, in the long term they tend to make the forest less resilient uh, and can, can result in problems down the road. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, any suggestions for suppressing greenbriar in forest gaps? And I can resonate with this one. When I spent time in Massachusetts, greenbriars were my, my worst nightmare going out monitoring properties. So I, I welcome suggestions there. Um, that's a really hard one. Um, it's one of those species that will regenerate after fire. In fact, it seems to like fire. Uh, one of my uh, um, fire advisors uh, said that it had uh, gasoline in its veins. Um, if you've ever burned a patch of, of green briar, it's it's a it's a frightening thing to uh, to happen, um, and it comes back just fine after after fire. So you can't use fire. Um, you're not going to pull it up by hand uh, <laughs> it, unless you have really thick gloves and uh, and you're wearing a leather suit. It's just not going to work. So really, your only options for suppressing green briar and forest gaps is going to be herbicide, which is going to be one of those things that some landowners are comfortable with and other landowners are not. Um, another possibility, which is a little bit more labor intensive, would be uh, uh, planting uh, larger shrubs that are going to essentially shade out the green briar, you know, in those forest gaps. That, that's a lot of work and a lot of money. Um, in general, herbicide is about the only thing that's going to work on something like that.
Um, the follow-up question to that is, do you recommend treating green briar any differently from true invasive plants? So um, let's talk quickly about the difference between an invasive plant and an exotic invasive plant. Green briar is, an inv is a truly invasive plant. It's not an exotic invasive plant. It's a native invasive plant. It's one of those plants that that is native to the area. It grows, it grows very well here. It doesn't have the same negative impacts from a wildlife perspective as an exotic invasive plant might. Uh, we primarily want to get rid of, it, of green briar because as humans, we don't like it. It, it hurts when you walk through it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a mess. Most wildlife doesn't have a problem with green briar. So in that case, I would say, yeah, you want to treat uh, in most cases, you want to treat native invasive plants a little bit differently than an exotic invasive plant. If you have an area where you're going to walk frequently, uh, you might want to use herbicide or something to, uh, to reduce or, or get rid of the green briar. But if you have an area where you have a path that goes near a green briar, briar patch and you're not trying to regenerate trees in that, in that area, it's not necessarily a problem with having that green briar there. You can just leave it there. And the same is true for the uh, for mountain laurel that I mentioned. If you have uh, a, a mount, big mountain laurel patch, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's it, they flower in the spring. It's it's just it's an amazing plant. On the other hand, if you have a dense stand of mountain laurel that is taking up acres and acres of your forest and is and is so dense that nothing is growing underneath it you might need to provide, you might need to take some actions, whether they're mechanical, fire, uh, or herbicide, uh, to, to reduce the area of, of that native invasive plant. I'm not sure if anyone has experimented with doing this. I certainly have not, so take this with a fairly large grain of salt, but if you have kind of gaps in your canopy in, uh, in the forest where there are patches of like thickets of briar, you might consider creating brush piles on top of the briar um, or undesired species. If you have say slash from a harvest or, or down debris from a storm damage, um, those types of brush piles can help suppress you know, block the tree from light and almost kind of suffocate it to death. Um, but they're also really beneficial for wildlife, even pollinators. Um, they, the small animals burrow under those piles uh, and pollinators take advantage of those piles of wood um, for nesting purposes and, and otherwise. So that might be worth trying out too. That's a really, that's a really good suggestion, Andrea. Um, one of the things to think about is, is time scales. And I touched briefly on this, but um, you know, we may have a gap in our forest and we think, great, this is where I'm gonna get my young baby oak trees to grow. And then the green briar comes in or the mountain laurel comes in and shades it all out. And now you've got nothing there uh, other than green briar or mountain laurel. Um, and so as humans, we immediately say, darn forest, you know, it's not doing what I want it to do. Uh, and so we think, how, how do we get that? How do we get that green briar out of here? How do we get that um, mountain laurel out of here? But maybe the answer is it'll get out of there eventually, just not necessarily in the seven year time frame that, you know, you as a landowner might be looking at, or even a 20 year land uh, time frame, or maybe even within the, you know, your ownership of, of, of the, or your lifetime. Uh, but doing something like saying, I'm going to turn this gap, instead of it being a place to regenerate trees tomorrow, uh, I'm going to throw a bunch of slash in there to pile up, you know, pile up uh, enough woody debris to make, a, to make a wildlife pile to provide habitat. And over time, that will reduce the competing vegetation. Eventually, that uh, wood will rot and go and pr uh, provide additional inputs of nutrients to the forest floor. And at some point, it may then become an appropriate place for those oak seedlings to grow. It might not be in the time frame you were hoping, uh, but it it absolutely uh, may may be beneficial to wildlife. Uh, so 
a lot of great information about greenbrier. Uh, moving into a, a different species, how beneficial is striped maple or Acer pennsylvanicum for wildlife? Uh, well, uh, I'll, first of all, I'll tell you its uh, alternate name, which is moose maple. Um, <laughs> Moose, uh, striped maple, moose maple is an excellent source of browse. Uh, it's an understory tree that, uh, you know, I've seen it in, in a young forest. I've seen it get up to, you know, 30, 30 40 feet tall and, and be temporarily be a part of the overstory. But in general, it's a plant that you're going to see growing in the understory of a forest. Um, it's relatively short lived because it gets shade, shaded out by oaks and, and other trees that are going to that are going to shade it. But because it's an understory tree, it's accessible to uh, deer and moose and other browsers. Um, they will eat the eat the um, twigs, the growing trip, uh, growing tips during the uh, winter and early spring. Um, they will strip the bark off of it. Uh, it can, again, if you're talking about regenerating your forest and getting young oaks, uh, striped maple can be a uh, a real uh, source of competing vegetation that will that will block the light, and many people have a problem with that. But from a wildlife perspective, striped maple is great. Uh, it's you know it it, it does have some uh, some small early spring flowers. Um, I don't know what pollinators use it, but I bet some do. <laughs> um, and uh, and it provides that that source of browse. Great, thank you. Uh, next on my list um, is, is there a hierarchy among common native oak species as to which are best or worst for wildlife? No. <laughs> um, that, that's short... I would say there is. Well, so, so let, let <laughs> Just me, with let white me... oaks, I would say. Well, okay, that's true. I would say that that white oak probably are, if, if there's any winner in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, the wildlife values of, of our oak species, it would be white oak. Um, and the reasons for that, the, some of the biggest reasons for that are the, uh, the acorns are significantly more palatable. Uh, they are much less acidic. Um, that's why humans like them as well. That was, they were a, a major human food source primary, uh, prior to European colonization. And some people still make white oak flour. Uh, but for me, what I'm more interested in is not any specific oak species, but the diversity of them. If you have, if you had a forest of just white oak, then you know you're going to occasionally get a mast deer, but many other years you're going to have few, if any, acorns. Uh, and the wildlife species that are that are relying on that those oaks as, for a food source are going to be are going to see a cyclical food source, which means they're probably going to be moving on and off your land. Uh, whereas if you have some white oak and some scarlet oak and maybe a little chestnut oak um, or, and some black oak, which are common uh, drier, drier oak site species that you might have, then they're all going to be on a slightly different schedule and you're more likely to have, have good acorn crop every year. Not also, don't forget about our shrub oak species. Uh, we have two in southern New England that are relatively common, which is the first one is bear oak, uh, Quercus elicifolia. Um, and the other is uh, dwarf chinkapin oak. So the, the bear oak is also known as scrub oak, uh, and it's very common, especially in the, in the driest sites uh, in, in pine oak barrens. Um, and the dwarf chinkapin, also known as uh, uh, dwarf chestnut oak, uh, look, has chest similar to chestnut oak uh, leaves. Um, they are, they are um, dramatic producers of acorns. Uh, and they do it, uh, they tend to have more frequent mast years. Now it's a, they're shrubs as opposed to trees. So the quantity of acorns that any given uh, oak shrub produces is, is smaller than the quantity that, a, that an oak tree would produce. But ensuring that you have some of those uh, shrub oaks in your forest as well will really increase the diversity. And this is why we, a diversity of, of timing for acorn production. And this is why we see, for example, on some of the islands like Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, why we see such a huge population of deer is because they have oak forests with understories of shrub oaks. And the oak forests are relatively diverse with everything from scarlet oak to post oak to all sorts of things. Uh, and there's almost always a mast year every single year 
whether it's one of the tree tree species or the or the shrub species. So I would agree that white oak does have a special place in my heart. And any time that I'm marking retention trees, it's if there's a white if there's a nice white oak there, it, it's a keeper. It's staying. Um, but other than that, it's it's ensuring that you have enough different oak species. Uh, that will really get you there. And you may have noticed I didn't mention northern red oak. And the reason for that is that's our most common uh, oak species in, in, in southern New England. Uh, and your forester is going to want to manage for that anyway, because it's the most valuable uh, tree if you're looking to make any money off of your land. Uh, but from a wildlife perspective, it's no better than, than, than the others. Very helpful, Brian. There's so many things to Think about oak species, you know, for wildlife and, you know, which will grow best on a particular site. Of course, there's timber value and, and then also you have to think about their resiliency to a changing climate, but we'll be learning more about that during the series. Thanks. And I highly re recommend to everyone, if you have an oak forest and you're walking in someone else's oak forest nearby, pick up some of their acorns. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I'm an inveterate acorn picker upper. Uh, I just toss them in my pocket of my, of my cruising vest. Um, and then when I get to a place where, where that looks like it only has one species of oak, you know, you just, I'll be a blue jay and stick them in the ground. Do any of them, you know, do many of them germinate and produce oak trees? Who knows? Uh, but they probably do. Uh, and uh, Bruce Spencer, who was the chief forester at the uh, Quabbin Reservoir in central Massachusetts for many years, uh, he, he's the one who I learned this from. And many of the oak trees that are growing near the Quabbin are from, uh, are from acorns that he stuck in the ground. Great. Thank you, Brian and Christopher and Andrea for, for your thoughts there. Um, th this question has popped up a couple times. Um, do you have recommendations on how to deal with deer and uh, some expansion on that? There are a lot of deer in my neighborhood. What can I do to help control deer populations beyond my own property? So on the property and then off the property, um, dealing with deer. So um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try not to be um, irreverent. Uh, but I will quote Bernd Blasi here, uh, who says that the, the best thing to do with deer is to eat them. Um, <laughs> uh, but seriously, it's absolutely true that our only reliable method of controlling deer populations uh, in, in southern New England is with managed hunting. Uh, this can be very hard if your oak forest is in a, uh, is in a middle of a residential uh, you know, development. So what you really want to do is you need to be in touch with your neighbors, if, especially if they have larger land holdings. You need to be in touch with the town about town forests. Uh, you need to be in touch with anyone who owns you know, significant amounts of forest to convince them to open up their land uh, to hunting for, for managing the deer population. Now, uh, if you're concerned about firearms, you know, and you're, you're in an area where discharge of firearms is, is not safe uh, because of the density of housing, uh, then you can look at allowing, um, allowing hunting using, using bows, uh, bow and arrow, depending on which state you're in. Some places you can use uh, crossbows, but uh, there, are, there are methods for hunting which will reduce the deer population uh, that don't necessarily involve using firearms. Uh, so is there, are there any other solutions for, for what to do about deer? There really isn't. Um, there, you know, people have tried doing things like uh, capturing deer and, uh, and sterilizing them and then releasing them back out. It's very expensive and it also doesn't work because it may work while you're doing it, but you have to essentially capture almost every single female deer uh, in, order to, in order to do that. Uh, and they're just, there's not enough money to go out and sterilize every deer out there. Because if, if just a few don't get sterilized, you're gonna have a big deer overpopulation problem again. Um, you can try fencing if you have a small area. So for example, if you have a, you know, if you had a five acre um, uh, oak forest behind your house and uh, there was an, you know, one particular part of it that where you were really trying to get some additional oak uh, started, you could put up some fencing around it. It's not going to keep the deer out entirely because they will jump over pretty much anything other than an eight to 10 foot fence. 
but you'll at least encourage them to go elsewhere. Again, that's expensive uh, and not a sure thing, but that is another option. Other than that, I just have to just have to underscore, talk to everyone in your town and, and convince them of the importance of, of managed hunting as a way of controlling deer populations. Because if we don't do that, we will lose many of our uh, understory species in our forest and we will just have more and more uh, spread of invasive plants instead of our native plants. It's also worth mentioning that say after a timber harvest uh, where you're trying to protect the regeneration, uh, there are a number of uh, foresters, you know, maybe including you, Brian, who will, you know, try to leave, you know, slash high so that it's a less attractive area for, you know, deer to come into um, and potentially eat the uh, oak regeneration. You know, that can have, a, you know, limited effectiveness sometimes. Other times it can be quite effective or to have, you know, larger patches. And, you know, now there's um, some interest and uh, research um, going on on, the, you know, the use of, uh, you know, woods slash walls and harvest areas to, you know, to try to, uh, you know, protect areas uh, where regeneration is seen as particularly important. And um, uh, they're trying to make this uh, viable as a NRCS cost share practice too. So we'll see what comes of that. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the slash walls, Christopher. That's that's an important thing. We are hoping to do some, you know, do some uh, some experimental, well, not quite experimental, but some uh, some attempts at slash walls on mass wildlife land. Uh, hopefully, in the next few years, uh, to see how that works for us. Um, leaving slash to protect uh, oak seedlings and regeneration is a is a great solution. It you can run into problems, regulatory problems, depending on the state. In Massachusetts, for example. Uh, all slash is required to be uh, disposed of in a manner that reduces fire danger. And depending on who the service forester is, they may interpret that in different ways. Since oak forests tend to be our drier forests that are also more, uh, more um, susceptible to uh, wildland fire, it, it can be hard to, to convince them to let you need, leave enough slash around that's high enough to prevent the uh, um, prevent the deer from getting in. If you just leave, you know, if you lop and scatter your slash, which is what most service foresters will require, at least in Massachusetts, um, it's gonna be, it's gonna tend to be under, you know, under a foot thick. Uh, and that's, the deer don't care about that. They'll just walk right through that. You need to be leaving uh, slash piles that are, you know, that are uh, not lopped, that are um, uh, variable in height, and that may be three, four feet high, at least, you know, just so it gets to something where the deer don't want to walk through it because it's longer than their legs. Great, thank you both. And we had a couple of foresters chime in in the chat window as well. Um, Keith Ross says, what about signage? Um, and Alan Baran says, slash walls seem to be working well at the Arnott Forest for Cornell and a good way to use a low grade wood too. Um, and we'll move into probably our last question here today, and I'll direct it directly to Brian. Does mass wildlife manage oak forests for wildlife? Yes. <laughs> mass wildlife absolutely manages oak forests for wildlife. In fact, mass wildlife manages all of our forests for wildlife. Um, well, excuse me, all of our forests that mass wildlife manages are managed for wildlife is what I should be saying. We certainly have uh, forest reserves that we don't manage at all. Uh, and then we have we have many other forests that are minimally managed uh, for depending on the location in the state and the and the ecosystem that we're managing. Uh, but in general, ev everything that that my staff does is specifically focused on wild on wildlife values and wildlife benefits. It's kind of as a forester, it's a great job to have uh, because most foresters are are focused on making money because that's what the people landowners want. They, you know, yes, they want wildlife, but they also want money. Uh, for a wildlife forester in, in, at Mass Wildlife, we, you know, we do still need to get the best value for the for the uh, inhabitants of the Commonwealth. Uh, but the best value is not merely monetary; it's primarily wildlife resources. And those wildlife and that and those wildlife resources range everywhere from uh, game species uh, to uh, non-game species to rare and endangered species. Uh, everything from uh, uh, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, 
uh, invertebrates, uh, plant species, everything. Great, thank you. Um, and this last question is kind of a, a preparing for next time. Um, how are those canopy gaps created to let the light to the forest floor? So if anybody wants to jump in with a quick final thought, we'll start to get ready to move on into the next session on Thursday. Well, the I'll, I'll jump in. I, the major ways the canopy gaps are created is in an older oak forest. So, you know, a forest that may have been unmanaged for, you know, 300 years or more. Um, you, you begin to get large trees that, uh, that will senesce and, and die. Uh, oak trees can live 300, 400 years or more, um, but you will get individual tree, large trees that die. And when they die, uh, they will either cre uh, create a gap just by dying in place or by falling over um, and, and creating a gap that way. Uh, you also can get uh, canopy gaps from wind disturbance. Uh, you can get canopy gaps from lightning caused fires. But the primary way of creating those canopy gaps is uh, using uh, human intervention, in particular using uh, uh, forestry techniques, uh, logging uh, to remove some of those trees uh, to open up the canopy and let the light, let the light down. I did want to also just quickly get back to, to uh, um, Keith Ross's question about signage. Um, I'm not quite sure what he was, was referring to there. We were talking about deer at the time that he posted that. Um, in my experience, uh, putting up signs that say no deer doesn't, doesn't keep them out. Uh, but, but seriously, I suspect he was probably talking about signage regarding uh, hunting uh, on, on different lands. So if you are going to, if you are interested in opening your, your land to hunting, uh, you, the first thing you need to do is not have any signs that say no hunting allowed, <laughs> but you may want to have signs that say hunting by written permission. For example, if you have a small air, a small uh, forest that uh, where you, uh, you know, that's close to your house, you may want to have written permission. You may want to have uh, signs that say, you know, uh, no hunting is allowed within 500 feet of my house, but the rest of my land is open to anyone. Uh, you know, you should think about what it is in your forest that, that you want to do uh, in order to enable that management of, of the deer herd uh, and uh, put up the signs so that it's clear whether, uh, whether hunters need to contact you, whether they don't need to contact you, uh, or how you want to handle that. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. This was a really informative session and a great way to kick off this series. Um, I want to thank all of the participants for coming today, um, and I hope to see you back here on Thursday for our upcoming session on forestry, um, which will begin at 4 p.m. Our speaker will be Fern Graves, who is the Principal Forester and Stewardship Program Coordinator for the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. And as I'll close all of our sessions here, I want to thank all of our partners that are crucial in making this project possible. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of increasing oak resiliency in the southern New England forest, and it wouldn't be possible without all these great groups um, supporting the effort. So thank you. Uh, and, and Logan, one of these days, we're going to get you to, to add the Mass Wildlife logo to that, to that slide. Well, we sure are. I can go back and uh, get it in there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's right there. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. We'll see you back here Thursday. Take care.